Okay, we almost started with that all, all of our people that were not here that are going to watch this on the internet. So, uh, and we know that there's those that watch. We, I still get notifications even through during the week of, of people watching our videos. And if you do, this y'all, if you do catch our videos on the internet, hit like on Facebook, or if you're on YouTube, you can subscribe to the Eastview Baptist Church channel. That helps, okay? And it makes the work we show up uh, out there more. Like that video and, and share it, uh, subscribe, all that, that's, that's real important especially on YouTube because people just roll through. I watch hours and hours of YouTube. There's nothing else on TV. But those things will just pop up in your feed and somebody go, hey, what's this? And they'll click on it. So that's, that's a way of helping to do ministry is being able to do that, just help share that out there. So I uh, just want to make sure of that. So anyway, um, we want to, uh, like I say, all those that aren't able to be here who catch this on the internet, whether it's live or whether it's recorded, uh, later, we don't want to leave them out. So, but we talked about Daniel, um, and, and and we see that uh, um, God is an absolutely incomparable God. He has no rivals. Uh, we see that in this dramatic rescuing of these three uh, Hebrew uh, young men, and um, this this rescue operation that God just did in Daniel three, uh, which we looked at uh, in 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 detail. It's profound and it has a profound impact on a pagan that's watching uh, all this. That, that he, he orchestrated all this trouble, but he's watching all this and, and experiencing it. And that's the Babylon King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and, of course, we remember everything else in the book of Daniel relates to a special time period that Israel is now in, which is the times of the Gentiles, where they are outside of their land and they're having to live for God on a foreign country. Um, it's kind of what we're having to do, right? Live for God and in a foreign country. Uh, I remember I watched uh, Louis Gombert say that if this doesn't if this doesn't stands as it is, we've lost the republic. I've had others say that 2016 would be the last election that we actually was able to make our votes count, and after that, it's no more. Uh, you know, and uh, so it, things are going to be changed. Things are going to be very different. Uh, when you don't have any confidence in your elections and you don't have any confidence in your government, you don't have any confidence in anything. Well, we've got confidence in God, I can tell you that. It was going to be, uh, uh, could be very difficult in the future for us as Christians. So we're moving to chapters 2 through 7. Uh, chapter 2, we studied where he had a dream and he asked us uh, wise men, so to speak. Uh, to give him the dream and the interpretation, and he couldn't, you know, uh, and, and he demands, demands death to all the wise men in the kingdom, which Nebuchadnezzar is one of those guys that <laughs> he's rocking along fine, and one thing happens, boom, off with their head, that's it. Um, he, he's, he seems like that's the first thing he goes to, not anything else, that's the very first thing that he does, uh, goes straight to, 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 to kill him. Um, and we know that Daniel goes to prayer and with, his, with his friends and he's able to give Nebuchadnezzar this revelation to this dream. And so then uh, Nebuchadnezzar sees that and, and uh, he says, wow, that's something. And he, he gives them uh, things and, and, and all that. The next thing you do, we have people who are probably jealous of what they've been able to obtain and make this get the king to make this rule about falling down to this uh, statue that he has erected and uh, of course they don't uh, hebrews not going to do that and they're they're thrown and and uh, bound uh, actually completely clothed in this flame and furnace nebuchadnezzar goes into that rage again heats it seven times hotter than than its normal temperature and uh, even the guys threw thrown them in uh, perished died in the fire instantly when they threw them in but then as we look, we see that he, he sees a fourth man show up in the fire. He's an emissary of God to rescue these, these Hebrew youths. And, uh, and in the rescue operation so complete, we see that they don't even smell of smoke or a fire on their clothing or anything else. Nothing is singed, no hair upon their head. Nothing is, is, is singed at all, but yet the ropes are burned off that they were tied and bound with without damaging anything else. Um, and uh, uh, we see a complete miracle 
in the Bible. And that's the way God does things. We see a history of that. His miracles are absolutely complete. Uh, when he does it, it's an A-plus job. It's not going to be uh, anything less than that. And, um, you know, we, we see uh, 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 that when God does it, it, it does it uh, uh, so perfectly. So we have a number one that we see in this uh, section we're going to be talking about today is an exaltation of God. Where Nebuchadnezzar is going to exalt God in verse 28. And then number two, we have a decree from Nebuchadnezzar in verses 29. And number 30, we have the continuing prosperity of the, the Hebrew uh, youths. Um, and, and it's kind of tempting to just run through that, go, yeah, 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 go right through it and go on. But I think we need to focus some attention on it this morning as to, uh, uh, as to what's going on. So let's look at uh, Daniel uh, chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 24. We're going to read through the end of the chapter those few verses there. And it says, uh, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. The Nebuchadnezzar came to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains, and king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was there an, a hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. So we see uh, 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 some things there. One thing I always wondered, what are they doing with the bricks? You know, what's, what's the deal of the fiery furnace? Why do they need a fiery furnace? I, I, you know, I, I always wondered, you know, did everybody have a fiery furnace? Well, yes, in Babylon, um, this is talking about the Babylon of Western Iraq that exists today. You can go there, they were building all these things, all these buildings, and it was all the bricks and all the things that they were. It's a kiln is what it is. It's a huge kiln, like going to, to one of the pottery stores or whatever. They have these huge walk-in kilns that you carry stuff in, and they, they fire this stuff. And they're firing these bricks up is what they're doing. And they're building and building and building. Um, there's more to go into that. I'm not going to this morning, but there's different Babylons. There's a political, there's a physical, actual real physical place, Babylon, uh, like I say, that you can actually go to today that Saddam Hussein tried to rebuild. He was going to be, you know, he thought he was going to be the root of the world, what he wanted to be. Um, and anyway, um, the globalist and stuff shut that down. George Bush shut it down. That didn't happen. So he wasn't going to be the one. He was going to rebuild Babylon and Babylon be over the world. But the Babylon in the end times won't be actual physical. It'll be physical but it won't be that, that actual place. It'll be political and it'll be a, a spiritual Babylon. So there's different ones. But that's what they were doing, of course, is building uh, their empire and, and uh, building all that. You know, they got the, the, the it's beautiful over there. We got the big blue uh, rock, you know, bricks and stuff and the paintings and the frescoes and stuff. And it's, they were, it was a pretty awesome thing is what we can tell from, from archeology span and and from uh, things like that as to what, and what they have existed. But we see this, and, and the first thing that, that we see is after he sees this happening, um, they, uh, uh, 
He says, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel, delivered his servants, and put their trust in him, violated the king's command, and yielded up their bodies as not to serve or worship any god except their own god. He understood that they were completely committed to God. Completely. And would yield up their bodies. And they did. Um, that's a huge, huge impact that made on him. And he saw that. Now, he is not a believer yet, okay? I don't think he's yet a believer. He's, he's seeing some things, and he's understanding a few things, but he's not completely uh, everything just yet. And he said he delivered his servants who put their trust in him. And he, he sees that, uh, uh, what they have done. He said, so blessed be their God. And... Um, what he did is basically he added in uh, the God of, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into all the other pantheon of gods that they worshipped. Okay, so he's on, you know, Yahweh is on the same level with all these other gods. And he's put added them into the list. So he's getting closer, but he's not giving everything over yet. He understands that this God is extremely powerful and a little more powerful than the other ones, but he's still putting them right at the same level. And that's what they did, is they believed in multiple gods. Everything had a god. The, the water had a god. The sun had a god. The, every, you know, the earth. Everything and every part, they would make up a god for and, and worship that god for, those, for whatever those things were. And it's, it's just another god. And that's what he's put Yahweh, uh, uh, Jehovah God, into is... As just another God with all the rest of them yet. So he's not figured out yet uh, who God really is yet. Now he will later on. And, and he hits what everybody, every single believer has to hit. And I think that's rock bottom. Uh, however bad that is or whatever different it is, every believer has to come to that end in their life that they say, I'm, I'm done with all this and I know this is the true God and I'm going to give everything to him. But anyway... Uh, uh, we see that. Um, and he, he, the first reaction that he sees when he sees this absolute miracle that I guarantee you he has never experienced in his life, uh, never seen before, anything like it. Um, and he's probably done this before, by the way. I mean, just think about it. Everything he does, every time he gets across with somebody, instantly, bam, kill him. That's it. Why would he not have already done this with other people who have come against him or done something or whatever and got mad and thrown them in the furnace? Uh, you know, there was instances, in, uh, as I studied this, in, in uh, uh, secular history of, of kings doing that, you know, doing whatever, all kind of crazy stuff. Some of the things were, I mean, really, really brutal. Um, but, you know, we're throwing them in, stuff like that. So this is something that he would be probably used to doing. Uh, to different ones at different times. But when he saw them come out, his first reaction immediately is to worship the Lord. Um, and that's what you get, is worship is a response uh, or it's a reaction to truth. Um, you're just so overwhelmed with what you've just heard or what you've seen or what you've read or whatever. This the natural reaction is to immediately glorify God. You know, worship has very little to do with uh, if, if we have six people on stage and we have drums and we have c contemporary music or whether we have a piano or organ or whether we have one person leading or whatever. It doesn't have anything to do really with the type of music that we listen to. But yet a lot of times that's what it, it gets reduced to. Um, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with... with uh, 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 very little to do with a particular song that gives us an emotional euphoria. Music is extremely powerful, and, and we can listen to songs, and there's a lot of songs you listen to, boy, that's a, oh, that's a great song, man, I, I love that. Then you read the lyrics, and it's like, eh, that's not so good, <laughs> you know? Um, and a lot of times we grow up listening to songs on the radio, and it's like, yeah, you know? Then you read the lyrics, and you're like, is that what they're saying? Oh my gosh, I can't believe that. Uh, whatever. Um, but it, it, it evokes these emotional euphorias in us and, and uh, you know that's the way a lot of I would say a lot of the churches nowadays, not all of them many of them 
operate on is, is emotionalism. You got to have an experience. If you don't have an experience, it's, it's focused completely on experience. Not on knowledge of the word, not on the stuff that's going to help you out in the real world when your spouse is about to die and you're having to hold their hand. Um, not those things, but it helps you feel better about yourself. Get your self-esteem back up. Think better about yourself. Have five ways to increase your faith and things like that. And, and uh, it's all emotional and a high. Uh, you go into a lot of places, it's, it's a, a driving beat. And it just gets you all excited. It's like youth camp, you know, when you went to youth camp. And it was all great and excited. And expect that to continue on through. And uh, that's what somebody told me one time. <laughs> said it felt like every time I went to this particular church, it was like youth camp all the time. And after a while, it was okay. You know, it was okay for a little bit. But after a while, it was like, you know, I'm, I'm hungry. I feel like I'm eating popcorn and candy all the time. I'm, I'm ready for something solid. It just it doesn't last all the way through. It, it, it's hype. Um, and, and that happens. Um, you know, we want to be able to get the right, right liver quiver out of a melody or whatever. Oh, that makes me feel good. Um, but it has to do with, with truth and just being absorbed by that truth and just wanting to explode into praise and to God through whatever means are available. And uh, that's what true worship is, is just being able to, to explode and just to do it. Uh, you know, and, and whatever that's appropriate and right at the moment, and what's, a, what's available. Um, it's a natural reaction that is uh, when we see God work and really see Him perform, that just changes us then. We can really see God doing something. That is, that's the true worship. Um, I've always felt like a, a, and had been, you know, my, uh, been influenced that. When we do illustrations and stuff, sometimes it's okay, it's okay to use an illustration in your teaching or preaching or, or if you have a Sunday school class or whatever else, it's something that happened to you or your experiences or, or some other uh, life experiences that people use. I've got all these books that have all these sermon illustrations, you know. You're just looking for something to help drive a point home. You can find all these quips and quotes and, and short, pithy uh, statements, <clears throat> but... It's just hard to build on, on short, pithy statements. Um, but if you can find the illustration in the Bible, and I think that about 99.9% .9 of the time, if you find you can find that other scripture or another illustration in the Bible that's going to drive home your point, and that helps that other person so much more because they're ingesting scripture, and they can actually see and read and get all the details of, of whatever that illustration you're using is, if you comes from the Bible, <clears throat> and I think they should be biblically based. And I tell you, our songs certainly should be biblically based. Um, you know, I, I, a lot of the old hymns are, are so good, it's all so good, they last. I mean, they, some of them are written, gosh, I mean, even as, as 15, 16, 1700s, 1800s, uh, early 19th century, you know, you'll see these hymns, and they continue on and continue on because they're just so well and they can preach you can take some of these hymns uh, the songs out of this hymn book and just preach from it because it's almost just scripture um now there are still some in there believe it or not there are some that aren't that good theologically they're not exactly right um but it's still good um uh, but but maybe they're not right but today um most of what we see today with worship has to do with people's preferences and what they really like and what they really want. Um, one generation likes it this way, another generation doesn't like it that way, or whatever. It's usually all about ourselves. Um, the worship that we see in a lot of places is all about ourselves. What do I get out of it? What do I, I want something to get me going. Uh, you know, and that's it. And if it don't perform and serve me well, I'm going to go on down to the next church that can, can do that. Um, you know, people jump and move churches all the time. Uh, and I think there's nothing necessarily wrong with that if, if they're not preaching the word and, and uh, they're, they're not, you know, preaching the whole counsel of God and, and, and all that. But a lot of it is just to move the one that has the most and best entertainment. Um, you know, do they have fog machines? Do they have laser lights? It's just so cool. They got the, the colored lights and it's great. And, and not necessarily that's wrong in every situation, but it's looking for something that will serve me and make me feel good and that's it and, and they walk away with very little uh, in the way of theology very little in the way of biblical teaching
to really understand the nitty gritty of the, of the Bible and, and, and God's character, His will, uh, how, what we believe, why do we believe it, and how can we defend that to someone, and uh, those things are the most important thing. Um, it's about wanting to get into the presence of, of, of God's people. It's about Jesus, okay, and it's a, to glorify Jesus Christ. It's the very things that we uh, celebrate at the Lord's table. He's our creator and our, our, our redeemer. Um, Nebuchadnezzar responded the way he did with, with worship, with, with true worship. And um, bless the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now you want to watch this guy carefully because he's, he's, his story spans four chapters. One, two, three, and four. We'll go into four next, next week. And I think what you're seeing is a softening of this heart of this pagan king. We're slowly seeing it. And uh, God is gradually at work in this man. And, and you see that at the end of chapter 2. In verse 47, it says, The king answered Daniel, said, Surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. Uh, since you've been able to reveal this mystery. He can see that, but he's not ready to jump on board just yet. But God is working with him. As we talked about before, sometimes people who are the most adamant against the gospel and, and seem to be the hardest might be the ones closest to fixing to flip and become a Christian. Uh, we've seen that in the Bible. We've seen that uh, uh, many times. Paul certainly was one of them. Uh, right at the height of everything that was going on and killing and persecuting Christians and putting them in prison is when uh, Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and changed him instantly. Um, we see uh, uh, so many times that happens. Uh, you know, I, I said before, what's kind of scary are those that just, meh, you know, don't care, whatever. They they don't have any desire uh, one way or the other to make any change. They're like, okay, well, that's your belief. It's my belief. It's no big deal. They just don't ever take it serious. And, and they probably won't ever. Um, but those that, that really get crossways are usually taking it serious. And that's why they're so against it. So against hearing the, the scripture because God's working with them. And he's convicting their heart. And it makes it hard to listen to something uh, that you may not want to uh, hear at the time. We see it later in the first part, chapter 3, he says, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who see his angel and delivered his servants to put their trust in him and, and uh, violating that king's command and all that. And he makes that uh, 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 <clears throat> decree uh, that any people, nation, or tongue that speaks anything offensive against God of, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their house reduced to a rubbish heap. And, and he's already figured out, he said, Inasmuch there is no other God who's able to deliver in this way. He understands that, but he still hasn't put him uh, uh, into doing, uh, really uh, uh, coming to know God. And I think that uh, uh, the crescendo of God's dealing with him is going to happen in, in the next week, in next ch chapter 4, as we go through it. Um, and and uh, 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 Ron Rhodes wrote in his book, 40 Days Through Daniel, says, don't misunderstand Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar here. He's not here coming to, follow, to following the Hebrew God alone. He was still a polytheist who believed in many gods. The king basically essentially added Yahweh to a large pantheon of deities. And he has respect for God, but he's not a child of God. And... Um, um, And I'm going to tell you, and you know it, there's a lot of people, many people in the church who are like this. They go to church because it's kind of like the, well, their sort of thing to do. It's cultural. Their, their parents always went. They have a respect for Christianity because that's what their parents believe or their grandparents. And, and they want to, don't want to speak disrespectfully of Christianity. Um, they want to be able to be a part of a church because it's a thing that's, that's uh, uh, considered the thing that you need to do. Um, you know, you may be operating a business. I, I knew a guy that, that opened up a new business in town, and, and he didn't know whether he wanted to go over to. There was only two churches for him, the biggest churches in that community, whether he's going to be at the Baptist church or the Methodist church. Well, I understand there's a lot of similarities, but there's some big differences there, too. But it didn't really matter. He didn't know. He didn't care what they were. It was whichever would serve his client, base of clientele better as to which church. And he went to each one and looked around and got to talking to people and figured out which one would be uh, more, uh, uh, had more bankers, 
Uh, he had more uh, other leading people in the community who would need his services over these other people at this church. And so he chose his church to go to and be a member of um, based on what would help his business. I don't think he's a Christian. He could have been, maybe extremely backslidden. But that's what a lot of people do. And we see that in churches. I'm going to tell you, when the rapture happens in some of these really big churches, you're going to see a lot of them sitting in the pew wondering what happened to Fred next, sitting next to me. They're going to be there. And uh, the pastor's probably going to be there and continue on and say, well, they were the evil ones. You know, it's so in chapter 24. God took them like a thief in the night. He took them out of here. We're, we're, those are the bad ones. We're the good ones, you know, and he left us, you know, whatever. Um, so... Uh, uh, who knows? I'm just saying there's all kinds of stuff, but I see that. I see a lot of people, because you come to church, you can fake it all you want to. And, and he says, I don't want to be a member. And you come down front, and the pastor asks you some questions and talks to you and want to join, and maybe he visit with you at home. But you can, you can fake it. You can speak Christianese good enough to get in. You know, it's not going to know. It's not a mind reader, you know. He's going to do the, the best that he can to know that you're a, a Christian. At least try to know. Uh, in my former church, you had to be, you had to be there and visit for at least six months. You know, wouldn't just pop in and just join. And that's understandable. You kind of get to know them better. But nothing is a hundred percent. And a lot of these churches are real easy because the pressure that's been put upon them to grow numbers, 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 numbers. Got to have them. Got to have it. You know. And they'll just bring anybody in, and, and they focus on lost people to bring into their church, into their flock to build numbers. Um, you know, uh, uh, they, they, they have those and they have a lot of those people into their churches. Next thing you know, they get to know them real good. They're good people. They're hard workers. Um, and, and they're good folks as far as we see them as good. And they get involved going on mission trips and doing stuff. Now, sometimes, once in a while, they get saved. But now they've already been in there and everybody already thinks they're saved. They're not going to let nobody know. Or they won't. Or they'll finally leave or whatever. But you see a lot of that that, that come in. The people who aren't quite there yet. Um, they respect it, but they're not really a child of God. And, um, um, you know, uh, th there's, I, I, it's hard to tell 100%, but I think most of us can understand. Uh, those that are just so committed uh, to the church, there, there's a difference that you can see after a while. But a lot of them are hard, difficult to see. Um, we've seen example after example of those leading these big mega churches um, falling out completely. Say, I never was a Christian. You know, it's a way to make money, or it's a way to do this, a way to do that, and then they're they're not a Christian, and they leave the church and they go do whatever they're going to do. But they're not they're not leading churches. And how how can you do that? How did God work through somebody like that who was a non-believer and they built a church and pastored it and, and did all these things? Um, and we see that. And a lot of it because most of the people are not spending time in the Word and be able to call the preacher on the carpet or say, hey, wait a minute now. I don't know about this. I want to know about this. This is not right, you know, or whatever. They just hit the tops of things in the Scripture. A lot of preachers, they pick up Scriptures that sound good, pithy statements little memes okay a meme whatever that they make a meme and they take that scripture and they and build all kinds of stuff from without any context of where it comes from what's chat what's that chapter say what are the verses before and after what does the whole bible say in relation and context to that scripture so uh we, we see that they, they're they're respecting and and um uh you know they they um they live off the faith of somebody else basically um, uh, you know, but they have to have their own faith. Uh, this is, uh, God, uh, people have said before that, that God has no grandchildren, okay? He has no grandchildren. He has only children. <laughs> That's it. There is no grandchildren. You're either in or you're out, but there's no in-between. Uh, a lot of, uh, let's see, when I was uh, uh, in, in West Texas, uh, we had to deal with motor, outlaw motorcycle gangs, and then part of the clubs were the same way. They have what they call hangers on or prospects. You want to be a part of the club, you, you prospect, you come around, make sure you're going to work and do all those things. And they outlaw motorcycle culture while, you know, you have to hang around and, and not rat them out on criminal stuff, and you got to do some petty stuff to build it, and you're a, you're a hanger on her. You know, or prospects. You can be kicked in or out, but you got to be able to give everything to the club later. Everything, totally. You're totally in. You're totally out. There's no in between. That takes your place of your family is that club or that gang, uh, whatever it might be. Um, you have hangers on, and today I think we have a lot of hangers on. 
in the Christian faith. They want to hang on. They want to come and hang around and be around them a little bit. It's neat and it's fun, but then, but there's no real change in their life. Um, and and so I see that a lot. Um, Nebuchadnezzar responded in 28, saying that that. Uh, 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 about blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants. Um, and then some will say, well, do you believe in guardian angels? Uh, yeah, I do, <laughs> to some extent. Uh, and and, and uh, I don't know if every single person has an actual identified angel assigned to you that's constantly watching you all the time, but it could be, but I don't know if the Bible really says that, but yet the angel of the Lord in, in Psalm 34, 7 says, and camps around those who fear him and rescues them. Um, there's, there's myriads and myriads of angels. Their number is innumerable. They're created by God for a specific purpose. Hebrews 1, 14 says of angels, says this, are they not all ministering spirits and sent out to render services for the sake of those who shall inherit uh, salvation? God utilizes angels for us to help us. Uh, the Bible talks about they watch us all the time. They're continually watching us and, and, uh, and are there if, if it, we need protecting, God will send, have them protect us. Um, you know, we have a relationship with God, um, but, uh, and that's great. Uh, it should be enough to, to be united with Him. One, it's all powerful, but He has an extra work of grace. Uh, this created angelic realm uh, for the purpose and the sake of those who will inherit salvation. That we have that ability, have that uh, uh, available uh, to us. Uh, now we don't call them, we don't, we don't worship angels, we don't command them, we don't direct them. Uh, God is in absolute control of them. He's their messengers, he's their workers. Um, we don't have anything to, to do with them and, and worshiping them or anything like that. Uh, we see, uh, I've seen some of these churches that are calling down angels and, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, that's not what we're supposed to do, okay? That starts to where we have putting more emphasis on that angel, what to do. We see that, that when John uh, saw all that he did was raptured to heaven, first thing you did is try to worship the angel. He said, no, 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 don't do that. I'm just a fellow believer like you. I'm just a fellow servant. That's all I am. Do not worship me. Worship God alone. And then toward the end of Revelation, he tries to do it again. He's just so overwhelmed. He's like, no, get up. Don't do that. Um, angels will not accept uh, uh, worship or praise from any human at all. The very first thing they're going to do is direct that to God and say, do not do that. Uh, and, and Revelation says, do not do that. Get up. Uh, they was very direct in telling him, don't do that. Um, but uh, I think as we get to eternity uh, on the other side, we're going to be stunned as we look backwards and see what God, as he gives us the full picture of the number of times and the things and uh, uh, the ways that angels were dispatched to help us in time of need. And, and uh, yeah, we didn't realize it. We didn't know they're invisible by, by nature. Uh, they're large ministering spirits and, uh, and all that. So um, it, they do do a lot. In, in Billy Graham's book, uh, Angels... Uh, uh, God's secret angels. There's an interesting story there that has, has passed around, and I think it's pretty good. It's a real story. Uh, it's on page 16 and 17 of it. But there's a Reverend John G. Patton. He's a pioneer missionary in the Hebrides Islands. He told a thrilling story involving the protecting, protective care of angels. And I'm going to read a quote. It said, Hostile natives surrounded his mission headquarters one night, intent on burning the Pattons out and killing them. John Patton and his wife uh, prayed all during that terror-filled night that God would deliver them. When daylight came, they were amazed to see that uh, unaccountably the attackers had left. They thanked God for delivering them. A year later, the chief of the tribe was converted to Christ, and Mr. Patton, remembering uh, that what had happened, asked the chief what kept him and his men from burning down the house and killing them. The chief replied in surprise, well, uh, who were all those men you had there with you? Uh, the missionary answered, said, uh, there was no men there, just me and my wife. And the chief argued that he had seen many men standing guard uh, 
Hundreds of uh, big men in shining garments had drawn swords in their hands. And they seemed to circle uh, the mission uh, uh, statement so that the natives, uh, their mission statement, mission, uh, it says mission statement, it's supposed to be a direct quote, probably the mission structure, mission house, whatever, I don't know, but so that the natives were afraid to attack. Only then did Mr. Patton realize that God had sent his angels to protect them. The chief agreed that there was no other explanation. Could it be that God has sent a legion of angels to protect his servants whose lives were being endangered? You know, it's an interesting story, uh, you know, but I've known of many others that were uh, similar to that, that that have happened that people have testified to. But it's not a, a, a point of thinking that those angels are always going to be there to protect you or, or whatever. Our, our decisions are made upon our decision with God and our relationship with him, not whether he might save us or not. Uh, Shadrach, and uh, Meshach, and Abednego, as far as they knew, they were dying, and they were giving up their life. And the king knew that. He knew that, that yeah, their God, our God could save us, but, you know, it doesn't really matter. Uh, we'll go ahead and die in the fiery furnace, <laughs> you know. Um, if he does or not, we're not going to worship you or worship that image you set up. Sorry, that's just all there is to it. And, and they didn't know for sure what was going to happen. And, and we don't know sometimes for sure what's going to happen. Uh, we just know that we can count and trust in God completely. And that's what the key is, 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 is giving our trust completely in Him and, and saying that's, that's, that's what we've got and that's what we're going to do. Um, he may save us, He may not. But it doesn't really matter, you know. Um, and that's a hard thing to come to because you want to be able to live and go through and maybe He will save us, maybe we won't. Um, I, I know there's so many times that you, we've probably just missed something that, that could have been life-threatening or whatever. So many people that say, I, I was, got up that morning, was late, had a flat tire and to get on this airplane trip and that airplane crashed and I wasn't on it because of this thing that set me off late. Uh, we don't know those things that happen. We, we don't have any idea, but we're putting our trust in God and remember, not the angels. Not them. Uh, they're just messengers, and we put trust in God. And trust is, is really saying another way of believe. You know, we say believe, 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 believe for everything in the world, and we don't really understand the full context of what that means. Um, it, it means to believe is also to be persuaded of and hence place uh, confidence in. It's to trust, so it's to completely uh, trust. Uh, the Apostle John uh, especially utilizes that he, he uses the word believe 99 times and what does it really mean when you say believe now a lot we use the word in the term for everything and not, not necessarily in its context or biblical context but way back in the day a guy named Charles Blondin would tie a tightrope all the way across Niagara Falls and he'd walk that tightrope back and forth then he'd grab a wheelbarrow and they push that wheelbarrow back and forth across Niagara Falls. Most of you remember that, or may not have saw it. Then <laughs> some of you may have. <laughs> it's a long time ago. But a lot of us have seen it and seen pictures of it, and, and uh, old uh, videos or from from movie reels or whatever. But he would do that, and and he was he was so skilled that the crowds that would gather on the sides there and watching would watch him do this all the time. Then one of the days. Uh, uh, Somebody yelled out to the to crowd. Well, he yelled out to him. Says, "Do you believe that I can do this again?" He said, "I did it. Do you think I can do it again?" Of course, everybody. Like, yeah, we believe absolutely you can do it. You just did it. You know, he just went across. He said, "Okay, which one of you wants to get in the wheelbarrow?" Mm. <laughs> now, wait a minute. <laughs> I believe you can push that wheelbarrow. I don't want to push me. <laughs> you know, that's the problem. And, and that becomes a single condition by which a person is truly saved and ushered into eternal life is that kind of belief, okay? It's a complete trust in God. It's a reckon, knowing who He is and what He's done, not just a, a, a knowledge, head knowledge. I've talked to so many people, and when it's to them, talk to them, they, they have a head knowledge. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, He, he was here. He, he taught. He was a good man. You know, or, or yeah, I know there's a God up there, but I think I think most of us want to do mostly good. He's going to take us up to heaven. It's going to be all right, whatever. And and, and you can't convince them of, of anything because the way that we use believe 
uh, done. And that illustrates it very well. You know, watching uh, uh, years ago, all the exhibition shooters, I used to do a lot of shooting, but not like them, but they would do things back in the day that were lots more dangerous than they do now. But one of them hold the aspirin between their fingers and they'd shoot it out with a 22 rifle and the disappear or hold something in their hand and shoot it out or put something on their head or do all kinds of things, put them on a wheel, spin them around with balloons and they would, their husband usually would shoot and pop out the balloons and, and never uh, uh, miss. Um, that's true belief. Um, we don't do that now for sure, but, um, but that's what we're talking about, the kind of belief where I can put my complete trust in God Amen. no matter what, no matter what. And um, that's where, uh, at that point, this, this, this credence that, that Nebuchadnezzar is really paying, he's just paying mere credence to, to, to God right now, but it's where that biblical, uh, uh, that credence becomes biblical faith or trust uh, uh, in life. Um, we've got a lot of scriptures uh, that cover that and talk about. The concept is as old as Genesis 15, 6. We learn that Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Uh, the Gospel of John's filled with it. God wants us to understand that, that uh, uh, since whether we fulfill this condition or not depends on whether we're really God's children. Uh, Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it is what? It's impossible to please him. A person cannot please God independent of the avenue of faith. Um, you know, when you say, well, uh, I've, or I've trusted in Christ, and, and that's good. We, we certainly want to. Uh, but let me tell you something about faith. Faith is like a muscle. Unless you uh, exercise that muscle, it's going to atrophy. Now, I know a lot of us in here, <laughs> certainly me, uh, have muscles that have atrophied over time. They don't, we don't bend like we used to. We don't be able to do like we used to and, and uh, can't move around. Just, if you don't believe it, just back out of your driveway next time and look directly behind you. You know, All we can get is maybe part way, but you can't turn around and look all the way without getting out of the car and looking. Uh, you, just, you, know, you think about that, things, things atrophy over time. And faith is just like that in the physical world. It's got to be exercised and, and, and utilized. Romans 1.17, when Paul is quoting the Old Testament, he's here, he, here he says, but the just shall live by faith. And, and that just doesn't mean to uh, just believe and then forget about the whole thing. Uh, the pattern for, for God is for the believer uh, that the faith saves, which already happened in the past as a one-time event, making their salvation 100% secure. God wants to keep developing. Uh, as we move, not just from being a believer in Christ, but 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 having uh, 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 a, a walk with God as a walk with Christ as we continue on. Uh, now we know our eternity is secure, but we can make great progress in our lives as we continue to trust in Him and, and living by faith. Uh, that's so important because that's that's where uh, uh, things happen. You've heard it and said it before that you are probably the only Bible that most people will ever read. Uh, you know, everybody's a, a, seem to be an expert on, on Jesus and what he would do and what God would do when they just think about what the world will be and, and whatever they just think they know. They have no idea. They have no idea. They never read the Bible. But the way that you live and the way that you handle things and, and the way that God puts us in circumstances uh, for the reason is for us to be able to, to exercise our faith. Um, you know, if you never have experienced uh, certain things, how can you help someone else who hasn't experienced that or is going through that? You know, I got a, a friend of mine that, that uh, 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 tragically lost his uh, child, um, you know, when they were young. But uh, that really caused them to get serious about their faith. Um, you know, that child's in heaven. But I, I don't know how it worked out, but I think that God had to use that for them. Maybe, he, only God knows. And, and he's the first one to, to uh, uh, state that I, I don't know that I would ever have been real serious about what God wanted me to do. Maybe, maybe not. But that's what made me serious. And that's, that's changed his whole life with his wife and with his kids and with everything else as being a true believer. And he's utilized that experience to be able to help others who are in that same situation. Now that's a, 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 big, a big deal. But even the small things that happen in our life, God gives us those 
to exercise and to work them out. It's no fun to exercise. Uh, you know, the first of the year, we got all the gym memberships will be full. <laughs> and a lot of gyms, they make all their money for the whole year in the first month. <laughs> they may not ever be back. Uh, but you always have those. I'm going to try it this year and do it. But it's no fun to get in there and sweat and hurt and get up the next morning and you're sore. And to go back again, it's like, nah, I don't think I'm going to do that. It hurt too much. But with our faith, God does that to exercise us and exercise our faith that makes us stronger in him and we reflect what God's doing in our lives to other people. Nebuchadnezzar um, had, had put Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego into an impossible circumstance and, and they didn't even know if God was going to save them or, or whatever. Didn't know how that was going to happen. Um, and, but they were willing to do whatever it meant to serve God, uh, 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 no matter what. And and this uh, 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 Gentile, unbelieving, godless person looked at him and saw that, and God was using that to change this person, and and was working in their life. Now, they the three guys probably didn't have any idea what was going on. They just knew they were picked out, and they're now they're done. Um, you know the. This is how it ends. <laughs> you know, we, we got carried off from Jerusalem, got over here, we did good, we got exalted and lifted up, and now we're, we're done. Uh, you know, God's done with us. We're going to die, and that's it. Um, you know, but uh, uh, whatever. No, we see that, that he sees that, and that is making a big difference in his life. I think that that's real important. We need to understand that, that uh, people see God in us. Uh, you can say all that you want to say, but it's not really going to add up to anything until God see, until people see God in you and see it worked out in your life as to how you react and how you handle the things that, that happens in life. Um, we all, there's no, no promises for us. Uh, you know, a lot of people, they make a whole big living uh, in their ministries on, on, you know, you're going to get this, you're going to get that on prosperity and, and blessings and all that. And I hear people all the time, I've got me a new car, God has blessed me. No, you have debt is what you have, and the Bible says it's not good. <laughs> so that's just all there is to it. But, uh, you know, did somebody give you a, a car and say you don't owe it? Then God might have blessed you. But it's always physical things and not what God has actually done for them in their life. And we see that God will continue to bless us as we continue to honor Him and, and to do uh, uh, what he says uh, because we we are, 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 are the ones that's going to, to, to do that and uh, it could be so severe that it may cost us our lives it may not it may not cost us anything we got a crazy year probably ahead of us who knows what it's going to be like you know um, uh, but but you know we, we have to be able to think about all these things that may uh, continue to happen or whatever how are we going to reflect when people look at us how are we going to reflect these things are we going to do it the same way that they do uh, say the same things that they do or are we going to say no god's got it under control i can believe and trust in him we're we going to live that and show that uh revelation 6 9 said that when the lamb broke the fifth seal i saw underneath the altar the souls of those that had been slain because of the word of god and because of the testimony which they had maintained these are the tribulation saints who are standing for God to the point that they were prematurely killed. Revelation 12, 11 says, And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of the testimony, and they did not uh, love their life even when faced with death. And that's what God's trying to produce in us, this type of mindset, okay? That, that uh, uh, we don't love our life even up to the point of death. We may never have to get there. We may never have to do that, and I hope that we don't ever. But at the same time, we don't love our life. This life is going to be over with. We're here and we're gone. I mean, this is all there is to it. It's short. Um, you know, you, maybe you'll live to be a, a long and aged, but even that is nothing compared to, to the 6,000 years of time that a man has been upon the earth. And you consider uh, all of eternity yet to continue on. Um, your short time here is only, only very short. Um, you know, it's the interesting thing about being a disciple. It, it requires under God's power the yielding and the giving up of things that God says that needs to go um, and what needs to be done. But, but 
you know, what I've seen is, is whatever I give up, God has a, a, a real habit in life of replacing that with something better. So if you don't, you don't really discover your purpose in life, uh, uh, then you, you know, you're here even until the time you move into the realm of discipleship. As you, as you work through and you move into discipleship, that's when it really changes. We see that these three guys were, were certainly believers. And they were strong, but when they were tested and their faith was tested, they're more than just a believer. They're a disciple. They're completely given over to God. And Jesus told his disciples, said uh, in, in Matthew 16, 24 and 25, says, he said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life, life will lose it, lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. And that's the most important part. Daniel 28 said, and they yielded up their bodies so as not to serve, uh, 328, or to worship any God except their own God. So they're willing to give everything up for that. That's what God sometimes has to ask us to do. And, and, and even if it's a, a big deal, well, you maybe don't even have to give up your life. You're going to have to give up certain things. And God will help you with that, but it's a decision that each one of us have to make. We get down to the point of, of what I call rock bottom. Um, and it might be a, a someone who's just an a, a addict or a really bad guy, really uh, bad person, uh, full of sin, and they got to get to the point that they give up. Or maybe that they're not even nowhere near that bad as we judge bad by world standards. But it's a, it's the same for everyone to where we give up our own way and choose to trust in God, completely believe in Him, get in the wheelbarrow and go across the, the Niagara Falls with God and, and trust Him completely as we move into to, to, to being saved. And then as we're able to, to do that, we build ourselves as disciples, uh, as a God and what He wants to do in us. But He can change our life. We've got to be able to get to that point. And I would say that, that if you listen to it and you haven't done that, if you're a hanger-on, um, if you're a, a, a one that just kind of uh, checking it out, uh, you haven't joined any church and, and really want to be a part of it yet because there's accountability when you actually have real membership in a church. Uh, there's some members of uh, churches that don't really have membership. They're just people that kind of come regular, uh, you know, but there's no accountability uh, uh, to it then. Um, and I think God's going to want us to be accountable for, for the decisions that we make. But um, uh, maybe it's just uh, those that are just kind of checking out Christianity, uh, like the, to feel good and hear some good things, but don't want to commit themselves to that. I think it's time now to make that decision. We don't know how much time, again, that, that we have. Uh, time is short and, of the, uh, 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 and time is of the essence. And um, we need to be able to get with God and to give up all these things that we continue to try to do on our own and give our lives completely over to Him, allow Him to change us, uh, to forgive us of our sin, and, and He will come and live in our lives and to, to change us from the inside. The things that we used to like before changes. We don't like them so much because they're not appealing to God. And then as we get rid of those things and exercise that faith muscle, and as we grow, God replaces that with something else in our life. And uh, uh, we need to be able to do that, replace the... the, the uh, you know, time of prayer and Bible study and of just time with God uh, in our lives. Um, that's what's important that we need to do uh, in, in our lives and give it over to Him. So let's pray. Father, I just thank You so much again for the ability we have to be here. Father, I just thank You for the examples that we have in the Bible. Um, these are not Bible stories. These are real people, real events. And... Uh, all they had to make uh, real decisions. And um, to make a decision of life or death is, is, is probably the ultimate and, and most difficult one that we have to make. Well, Father, some of us will never have to make that. Let us just at least just make the decision to understand that, that uh, uh, whether we have to make it physically or not, spiritually, it's still there. Uh, we have life or we have death, and we have total separation from you forever if we choose not to accept you and to believe in you. I pray, Father, that those that are, that are listening, who watch this online, those that are here, Father, that, that we give their hearts to you, uh, Lord, that they would truly believe and, uh, uh, into you and, and become a Christian and, and commit their lives to you, Father. 
probably the those that, that uh, maybe have just been kind of hanging around some of these churches or hanging around Christians um, and not really going committed will finally do that. And Father, you will utilize whatever it takes to be able to bring them into your fold. Father, we know that there's no, no Christian, that's, uh, no one is ever going to miss going to heaven that you didn't already know and intend that will be there. And so, Father, we know that you're not going to lose anyone. Uh, Father, that you, you are the good shepherd and you will make sure that all that are your sheep, you will take care of and you will take uh, 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 into to heaven, Father. So, Father, we can trust in you completely for that. Father, just help us to live for you each and every day. Um, Father, that requires a relationship with you. And I pray, Father, that you just help us to cultivate that each and every day. Thank you for all that are here. We thank you for all those who, who may listen uh, online. Uh, Father, and I just pray that you would prepare their hearts, uh, Father, also, and uh, anyone that hears uh, our, our preaching and teaching, Father, uh, that you will work in, in them and work in them a work, uh, Father, uh, of salvation. We thank you. We love you. We give you praise in all that you're going to do. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.